polarization. It affects almost every aspect of American political life. Instead of voters being shaped by news, news is being shaped for voters. As the 2020 presidential election approaches, the United States seems more divided than ever. More protests and uprisings are expected in Minnesota and across the country. Overnight, police did use tear gas to disperse the crowds. Social media is at the heart of that story, playing host to the most influential activist movements and the most vitriolic political debates. But the more our political conversation moves online, the faster it seems to deteriorate. So how did services that promised to connect the world become some of the strongest forces driving us apart? And how can we improve their design before it's too late? The story of polarization is older than social media. It reaches back into recent history as well as the ancient past. To understand why social media affected us the way it did, we have to understand ourselves and how we got here. We evolved for tribalism. We're primates, and like other primates, we live in, in, in communities that are constantly in conflict with other nearby communities, and we are all descended from the successful tribalists. Democracy is clearly possible. We've done it successfully, many countries have. But I think the, the margin of error is actually somewhat small. Making democracy work with our tribal instincts is a delicate balancing act. We need enough dynamism and disagreement to make progress, but not so much that we fall apart. What you have to do is look at any society uh, as having forces pulling it together, let's call those uh, centripetal forces, and forces pulling it outwards, call them centrifugal forces. The late 20th century was a time when we had a lot of forces pulling inward. The balance between centripetal and centrifugal was extraordinarily positive. We were fooled into thinking that democracy is easy. We were wrong. There's a lot of competing forces that have converged concurrently to make all of this happen. This is Kami Akhavan, executive director of the USC Center for the Political Future. He's been tracking the trend of polarization since the early 1990s. The polls are getting farther apart. The average Democrat is more left than the average Democrat was 30 years ago. For the average Republican, same thing. There was a survey that was done in 2019 where the question was asked, do you think we'd be better off as a country if large numbers of the opposing party just died? 15% of Republicans said yes, 20% of Democrats said yes, and here we are. Social media arrived into an already polarized world, but starting around 2009, a series of design changes added fuel to the fire. So it was the like button, the retweet button, and then algorithmicizing everything. Those three changes convert social media to one of the greatest centrifugal forces this country has ever seen. Basically what we, what we call an outrage machine. It starts with the business model. Because social media runs on advertising dollars, its designers will do whatever it takes to keep us engaged. Social media platforms make more money the longer we stay on the platform. This means they have an incentive to present us with information that is most likely to draw us in, to keep us engaged, to keep us coming back and spending more and more time online. The most engaging content is content that triggers emotions, particularly moral emotions like moral outrage. So algorithms built into these platforms that select information to show to us push to the top of our feeds content that is likely to trigger strong emotions like outrage. Tribal emotions like outrage are part of our biological makeup. Within the appropriate scope, outrage helps bind together a moral community. But just as our taste for sugars and fats didn't evolve for a world full of fast food, our taste for moral outrage didn't evolve for social media. Biologists have a name for these kinds of triggers. They call them supernormal stimuli. A supernormal stimulus is like a prototypical stimulus on steroids. That stimulus is something that's potentially been engineered to provoke outrage and is not necessarily one that we would typically encounter in our daily lives. I think a lot of the fake news headlines that we saw in the lead up to the 2016 elections in the US uh, are really good examples of like supernormal outrage stimuli. The outrage equivalent of junk food is addictive. If it wasn't, the platforms wouldn't reward it and we wouldn't keep coming back. But 
it gets worse. Imagine if every time you ate a cookie, your entire social group cheered you on. We are connected with others on social networks. This means that if you express outrage and you're getting a lot of positive feedback, that might actually make the expression of outrage over the long term more habitual. For a democracy, the consequences of a citizenry addicted to outrage are catastrophic. We lose the ability to focus on any problem long enough to solve it, and trivial transgressions distract us from systematic reform. If social media is just sort of indiscriminately dialing up the volume on outrage, then this could create a signal-to-noise problem where if everything is worthy of outrage, then effectively nothing is, and it might make it harder for people to distinguish between the truly heinous and the merely disagreeable. Many people believe that polarization is caused by echo chambers, hermetically sealed ideological bubbles that prevent exposure to the other side. This suggests a simple solution, just get platforms to present each side with opposing viewpoints. But a 2018 study showed that mere exposure to opposing views actually increased polarization. And other research suggests that the context in which we see other views online is what matters, not a lack of exposure. The solution of we should just expose people to more viewpoints is a solution to the problem of the hermetically sealed version of echo chambers, which I think is not plausible. That is not going to make you suddenly think, oh, look at all these great points from the other side. Maybe I've had it all wrong. No. What it's going to do is caricature the other side and get people to double down into their own beliefs. Popular misconceptions about echo chambers highlight the essential role of good science in solving these problems. If we want to avoid the errors that got us into this mess, we can't go into the design process blind. So what can we do? The best thing social media companies can do structurally on the content moderation side of it is to have meaningful, sustained, compelling opposing viewpoints presented and slow down the frequency with which we can react. One suggestion for how to make our reactions less impulsive comes from Tobias Rose Stockwell, a writer on technology design. He suggests that platforms build AI systems that identify content previously flagged as toxic and ask users if they're sure before they decide to post. Another solution in technologists' hands is removing bots and ensuring that real people lie behind every account. The biggest single thing I think we need to do is, is we need to start authenticating identities to allow people to open accounts. I don't mean you have to post under your real name, but the age in which we can let anyone create thousands of fake accounts and make death threats and rape threats and, and throw and basically be trolls, that does not contribute to the public square. Those people's accounts should be closed down. Right now, companies lack the incentive to take on these kinds of reforms, in part because doing so would mean a decline in the engagement metrics that guide their every choice. This suggests a role for policymakers to intervene. Unfortunately, Congress's record of understanding these topics has been less than ideal. Well, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. Individual users shouldn't hold their breath waiting for systematic changes. For now, holding democracy together comes down to us, tribal instincts and all. But here again, better science is crucial. Until now, most of the research into social media and polarization has been reactive, responding to damage that's already been done. But what if designers could consult high-quality studies before implementing features that affect billions of users? What if individuals and policymakers were empowered by the best research when deciding how to treat these platforms? We're asking people to stand up against millions of years of evolution and the most powerful algorithms on Earth. They shouldn't have to do it alone. <laughs>